I saw us going through the trash cans. <laughs> what are those people doing? <laughs> that's weird. But that's part of what we're called to do, right? We're, we're, we're called to reach out it's in, in whatever way we can. And that's one of the ways that God gave us that opportunity. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you for everyone who uh, participated. Uh, before we get started on the... Um, the message, I just wanted to pray. I want to pray for the, the folks there, too. But we have a couple of urgent needs I think that we, I'd like to pray for. Um, and maybe you have an urgent need as well. If uh, you want us to pray for you, I'll be glad to pray for you, even if you don't, you don't have to say what it is. But uh, Lisa's mom is not doing very well. The kid's grandma is not doing very well at all, so I want to pray for her. Uh, Carol's mom just had uh, heart surgery. She's recovering from that, but she's... She's very weak. And uh, does anybody else have any very uh, an urgent prayer request we can pray for you today? Next uh, Sunday, uh, my daughter's getting married. Uh, this is an exciting time. We just want to see God be honored with this wedding and pray, uh, ask you to pray for us. I don't see him. Okay. I'd like to pray for Cheryl's son, Kevin, who is struggling with cancer. He had his son, and it's not looking good right now. Okay. My father has knee surgery in the future. Okay. You're going to test in my memory here. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm. That's awesome. You go to school there, so you know. Really? That's cool. That's awesome. Okay. Mike? Wow. Hmm. All right, you're going to have to help me out because I can't remember all those. And those of you that asked for them, can you just say a short prayer for them? And then I will, I will finish with the, the ones that I brought up so that because I, I remember those. So I'll finish that. So Kelly, why don't you start off and then just go ahead and speak up the prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful the way you lead in our lives. Uh, more than we're aware of at times. And uh, thank you that you uh, answer before we ask so often. Uh, you've heard our, all the uh, requests that have been mentioned here this morning. And I want to ask especially for the wedding of Athia and Zach next Sunday, that uh, you would be first in this occasion, that you would be honored and blessed, and people who come will be touched. Thank you for your kindness, your generosity, and, uh, giving us the privilege of being involved in what's deeply on your heart, that of the reaching the world to Jesus Christ by sharing him. Others really so take uh, these requests this morning, and uh, may you be worshipped, honored, glorified, and blessed this morning. Lord, we pray for uh, our brother Paul. Uh, we just pray that uh, you be with him this morning, Lord. I don't know what's going on, but uh, I just pray, Lord. Speaking to his heart and uh, helping him, Lord, uh, in a difficult time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for your being here with us even now. We, we sang it, that you'd come and be with us, and uh, it's sweet that, that you're here with us even as we share together and pray together. It's wonderful. It's, it's beautiful, Lord, and we uh, just bring our hearts before you, Lord. We, we uh, thank you for this outreach that took place last week. We pray for fruit, Lord, fruit that would remain. Pray that uh, those students' hearts that, that saw it, Lord, uh, their hearts would be moved and, and challenged. We pray for those that still have it sitting on their desk or wherever. They'd open it up and listen, watch it. Pray for, uh, for another outreach there, Lord, as uh, our opportunity might be to bring 6,000, Lord, if you'd open that door for us, Lord, you'd show us clearly. Pray for Lisa's mom today, Lord, and the kid's grandma, Lord, you'd have your hand upon her as her, her uh, time looks short, Lord, we, we pray that you would just be there with her, and, and uh, we pray that you would touch her, Lord, and that, uh, give her more strength and healing, and, and touch her body, touch her heart, touch her mind, Lord. Pray for Carol's uh, mom as she recovers, Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen her and, and uh, that she would, the outcome would be good from this heart surgery, Lord, and we, uh, we thank you for today, Lord. Today is all we have, Lord, and uh, may we live for you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bible, 2 Timothy, if you would, please. 2 Timothy. Let's see if we're going to work today. Yes. Right. Uh, 2 Timothy. If you want to turn there, we'll get started. Uh, famous last words. Famous last words. Uh, Dennis Rainey from the family, whatever it's called, ministry. Family life, is that it? Anyways, he said this. A man's final utterances reflect the life that he lived. I think that's an important context to think about here. A man's final utterances reflect the life that he lived. So it's not something that is just right then. It's everything that went up to. Everything that led up to that last time. Those things that we say. We looked on Good Friday right to Jesus, and, and one of the last things that he said, one of the last words that he said was tetelestai, which means what? It is finished, and it means also paid in full. Now, that's obviously for us as believers, that's radical. That's if Jesus didn't pay it, it's not, 
we're going to have to pay it ourselves. And so Jesus came and he paid the price for us. So that's very, very meaningful. Some of the things you can, you can look, and I looked and I didn't spend too much time, but you can look at some of the famous people who have said different things, and some of them are just plain ridiculous. But again, the context being what was their life and how did it end? And, and then some were just kind of silly, you know. How did you get there? How, you know, how they ended up with that, I don't know. But some are, are more meaningful and some are more fearful. I've got a few here I want to read to you, just a few. Uh, a guy by the name of Thomas Hobbes, who was an English philosopher in the late uh, 1500s, he said this, he says, I'm about to take my last voyage, a great leap in the dark. A great leap in the dark. That sounds kind of fearful to me. And then you got a guy like Jonathan Edwards, who was a, a preacher in New England in the 1700s. He said this, trust in God and you shall have nothing to fear. And he's now at his final days. Another one I found, and uh, you probably recognize this guy. His name's William Shakespeare. He said, I commend my soul into the hands of God, my creator, hoping and assuredly believing through the only merits of Jesus Christ, my Savior, to be made partaker of life everlasting and my body to the earth where uh, it was made. That's interesting. How many of you would have thought that he'd say something like that? You know, the, 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 the things, you know, where do we get to in the end? You know, wh where are we at in the end? Ten years ago, our good friend and my mentor, Bill Kinneman, passed away. And one of the last things that I heard him say was, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And as we left the room, uh, he died the next morning, but he was unconscious when I went back the next day. But the last thing he pointed up, he pointed up. You know, the, the final last words. Today's message, I want to I wanna talk to you today about Paul, the apostle. And, and really, this is his swan song. And you all know what a swan song is? Well, I'll tell you anyways. This is because I had to kind of look this up. You know, I, I knew kind of vaguely, you know, you know kind of vaguely what things mean. But, but uh, I really looked it up and, and it's this, a final accomplishment or performance, one's last work. And it has to do with an ancient belief that the swan knew the hour of its death and announced it with a song. That's kind of interesting. Now, there's debate about whether or not that's really true, but, there, you know, so that's where the phrase comes from anyways, a, a swan song. You're kind of, you're at the end, and this is your last hurrah. Yeah, right. So for Paul the Apostle, this is his last letter. Now, we're, we're kind of going through Paul's letters in the order that they are in the New Testament, but this is technically the last letter that he wrote, right? We still have Titus and then Philemon, uh, still to go, but they were written before this letter. So this is his last. He'd been serving the Lord for many, many years. He'd written many letters altogether, really 13, depending on, depending on what you believe about the book of Hebrews. I believe the, the book of Hebrews is, is uh, anonymous, that we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. So I'm not including that. But 13 books that he wrote, and so of those books... He's now writing. He knows that his time is short. He's about to be martyred. And he gives us this very personal and powerful letter. I, I kind of want today to be kind of a, a you know, context. So as we're going through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we, know, we, we keep in mind this is, this is the last writing that he gave to us. This is important. Now, Paul, they believe, was kept here in a place called the Mamertine Prison in Rome. And he was in prison under a guy by the name of Nero. Some of you have heard of him. That guy was brutal, absolutely brutal. But anyways, he was in prison in the Mamertine Prison. And you can see it's not a very nice place. In fact, 
this prison was first built as a cistern to hold water, and there's like a spring underneath. And so, well, we'll just change it to use for that. We'll just throw them in there so they kind of let them down through, you know, holes by ropes. This particular place, they really, and this might be one of the reasons why he knew that his time was near. They didn't, they didn't have, at that time, uh, in the Roman Empire, they didn't, they didn't hold on to people for a long time. It wasn't like you're going to be in prison for 10 years. No, we're going to hold you until we have your trial or until we uh, kill you, until we carry out that final sentence, until we execute you. So for him to be there, he knew. Now he's down in this prison. You remember earlier, though, Paul had been in prison, right? But it was very, very different. He was actually in a, in a house. He was like, it was like what we would have be calling a house arrest. He, he was in a house for two years, and he, he was allowed to have you know, friends come and go, and people come and go, and, and uh, you know, bring him Wendy's and stuff like that. You know, I mean, that's the kind of, that, that was very different. But now, now he's in a place that he's, he's chained. He is cold. It's cold and damp down there. There's no heating system, no television. There's nothing going on in this place. He's very alone. You kind of get that impression as you, as you read some of the verses here. He's very alone. He's asking Timothy, please come. Everybody has kind of deserted me except for this one. One Roman historian called this place, uh, he talked about this place, he said there was, it was neglect, it was darkness, it was stench. He says it was a hideous and terrifying appearance. This is all just context again as you read this book. You see, the letters that we find in the New Testament, they have context. They weren't just, you know, some writing. They're, they're, they're their context uh, is important. So we, so we know Paul is now in a prison, in a place, whether he was in this exact room or not, we don't know for sure. But he's in a place like this, and he's writing this letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. They at least let him have some kind of writing utensils, at least let him, you know, do what he was doing there to write this letter. Sending Timothy some kind of encouragement some kind of challenge, some kind of exhortation. But, but for, for you and I, I think, and this is the, the wonder of the Word of God, is that the words can be for us today too. They're not just for Timothy back then. That's why we have them preserved. God saved them for us. So you and I would have these words to be challenged, right, and encouraged and exhorted as well. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of stuff. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Y'all know that verse. That's in this, in this book. Anyways, look at uh, chapter 1. Just read a few verses there, and we're, then we're going to jump ahead. Uh, chapter 1 starts off like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the way he starts a lot of his letters off, with grace and peace. But notice he adds the mercy in there. He does that with, with Timothy. But I want you to jump with me. We're going to get back to the beginning next week and see and start from there. But... But again, the, the key verses, I believe, for this short book, four chapters of 2 Timothy, are found in verses uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. This kind of sets the stage for what I've been telling you so far about his last words. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And let's read those he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. That makes it apply to us, doesn't it? For all of us who long for his appearing. So he says there in, in, uh, in verse 6, he's already being poured out like a drink offering. And, and when you look back to the Old Testament law, the offerings that they would make, uh, uh, they would have, in addition to the offering itself, there would be like a, a drink offering that they would take a, a, a pitcher or a, a, a flask of wine and they would pour it out around the base of the altar. Kind of going along with the, uh, with the offering. And so the picture, and there's a lot of pictures here, but he says, he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. It's kind of a picture really for me to, to see that his life is, he, he's being all poured out for, for God. He's being poured out to God, an offering to God. His life is an offering. And I really believe that for you and I, uh, we're, we're not going to, uh, uh, have to go through some of the things that they, God willing, that, that, that they had to go through. Paul's life was about to be, uh, because of his faith, he was about to be martyred. But, it, but it's still true that you and I can offer ourselves as an offering to God. And I think we should do that every day. Make my life an offering. He says this because the time has come for my departure. Somehow he knew. Somehow he knew. How did he know? We, we don't know for sure. Maybe because of the sentence had already been passed and he was down there in that, uh, in that dungeon and, and that's pretty much the way it went. There's no getting out. There's no last minute reprieve by the governor. This is it. You're, you're done. So he knew that his time was very, very short. And I had to think about this, and, and maybe you're thinking about it right now. If you knew that your time was very, very short, what would you be thinking? What would you be writing down? What would you be telling people? That's kind of where he is in this letter. He knew his time is short. He said, I got I to get this down. Now, again, we don't wait until that time comes to try to figure out, well, this is what I'm going to say now. No, it's really a reflection of our life up to that point. And so for you and I, we need, to, we, we need to make decisions now. We make decisions today of how am I going to live my life today? And the things that we're going to look at here in the next verse, you know, to fight the good fight, to run the race, to finish the race, to keep our faith, those are like goals that we should have every single day so that when we get to the end, we can say with Paul those same things, you see. But I like what he said there. He said that he said the time of my departure is near. I like he said the time it's not the time of my end. Right? It's a departure. It's like the, the train is gonna leave the station, right? He, he says it's a departure, and, and for you and I too, that, that's exactly what it is. It's not the end. It's a departure. We're we're going somewhere, right? It's not, it's not an annihilation when a person dies. It's all over. It's, it's you know, depending our, on, our, on our faith in Jesus Christ, it, de it determines where our destination is, either with him forever or apart from him forever. Paul, Paul talks about this over and over. He says, you know, I would much rather depart. Earlier he said, I'd much rather depart and to be with Christ. That's far, far better, he says, but... At that time when he said that, he says, you know, but I know that it's better for you right now. If I, st I need to be here now. This is earlier in his life. Now he's saying, listen, it's, I'm going to depart now. But time's come. He knew it. But earlier, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I can. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do the best I can to follow you, Jesus, and and uh, serve you and be an offering to you. There was a, a guy who wrote some, uh, some word pictures from this word departure, and, I, and it comes out of the Greek word, and, and I think they're, they're pretty good. I like them. Number one is this. It's a, a seaman's word, where they talked about unloosing the anchor. They would use this word. 
Time for departure. Let's unloose the anchor. And that's kind of what it is, isn't it? We're no longer going to be anchored to this world. We're going to go. The next one is a plowman's word where they would uh, unyoke a weary team of animals after a hard day. A plowman's word. I don't know about you, but you ever get weary in this life? You, you wish you could get unyoked. And that's no yoke. <laughs> and then the last one here, a traveler's word when they would fold up the tent so that they could travel on. They could fold up the tent. That's, that's kind of cool, too. You know, my tent. But Paul talks about it as well. You know, the, this tent that we're in. I'm going to fold that up because I'm not going to need that anymore. i got a new tent coming, right? A new body coming for all those who trust in, in Christ. And I'm, and I'm going. He says, the time of my departure has come. David Guzik says this. He said, Paul was passing from the scene and Timothy must carry the torch. So this is kind of like a passing of the torch from Paul to Timothy in, in one sense. But Paul had done his part. Paul had done his part. Verse 7, the three things that he talks about there, I, I, I think are so important for us. Verse 7, the first one, he says, he's, he says, I have come, excuse me, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. And I was just thinking about this fight. You know, First of all, notice that he says it's a good fight, right? Which tells me there are some bad fights, right? There are some fights that we should not be fighting because they're bad fights. You know the saying, choose your battles, right? I don't know. I find myself sometimes in battles that I should not be a part of, you know? We, we need to be wise about who we're fighting, when we're fighting. We need to fight a good fight, the good fight. And, and, and that's really what we're talking about here. Choose the things that matter. But in, in the book of 1 Timothy, he, he gives a little, little more explanation. He says he calls it the good fight of the faith. The good fight of the faith. We're going to talk about that in the third uh, thing here in this verse as well. But he says, I have fought the good fight. And again, it's past tense, right? Past tense now because he knows his time is, is very, very short. But, but he's saying, I fought, and I fought up to the end. I fought to the very end, to the final round, to the final bell. And you know what? It, it is a battle sometimes, isn't it? How many of you want to just like say, you know, I'm kind of tired now. I'd like to step out of the ring. Any of you ever feel that way? I do. But that's why, you know, God gives us a little break sometimes, you know, you, and you see the picture of a boxing ring and, and the little stool in the corner, right? And then they sit on the stool and, they, and the guy comes over, his trainer comes over with the towel and kind of fans him a little bit, wipes his forehead, throws water on him, whatever he needs to do to get him, you know, to kind of revive a little bit and get back in there. God gives us those kinds of things too, I think. But sometimes I just want to, you know, I'm done with this. I'm tired. I can't, I can't do it anymore. Maybe you get knocked down. Paul says, I fought. I fought the good fight. I fought all the way to the end. The second thing he says there, he says, I finished the race. I finished the race. I think we can say that too. It needs to be the right race. Not the rat race, right? We need to be running the right race. Go in the right direction. Sometimes we can get off track. We don't feel like it sometimes. You know, I just want to give up. We get tired. We get weary. Those of you that, that know the NASCAR situation... When a car gets kind of beat up or blows a motor or whatever, they call it a DNF. You know what that stands for? Right. Did not finish. 
And they can't, they're done for the day. And they don't get any points. They don't get anything for that. They're, they're, they're out. They're done. Loaded up. But then you see other guys that, you know, they crash their car or whatever, something happens. They go into the shop and they might be in there for 20, 50, 100, long, long time getting this car fixed. But then they get back out on the track. Well, they're not going to necessarily win the race. But for them, for each one of them, they did what they needed to do to get back out there, you see. And they get some kind of credit for finishing, right? He's the expert over here. He knows. So you don't get that DNF. I don't want, I don't want when I get to heaven, I don't want to, I don't want to see that, oh, here's your DNF. Right? Do you want one of those? I want to be, I want to, you know, be one of those where he says, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to be able to say, like Paul, I have finished the race. I finished the race. I want you to turn back with me to Acts chapter 20. And again, this is going back before this period of time. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. You, you kind of get the, the sense of, of where Paul's been thinking all along. How did he get to this place in 2 Timothy where he said these words? Well, he got there, again, by how he lived and his attitude in life before he got there. He didn't all of a sudden make, you know, the last three days, well, I just finished the race the last two days. Well, that's not going to work, right? It's now. And look at Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He said, however, I consider, and he had been warned, the Holy Spirit warned him, he had prison coming, hardships coming, all kinds of stuff. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race. You see, that's his attitude. That's how he got to the place where we're reading in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, because he had this attitude. Listen, it, no, nothing else matters except that I finish the race and I do what God has given me to do. Now, we're, we're not all the same. God is working each of our lives differently. I can't, I can't run your race. We're not running against each other, really. You know, we're, we're only, we're, We've each got our own race that God has called us to, to run and, and gifted us to run and, and called us to, to be and do. You need to run your race, and I need to run my race. Now, we encourage one another. I love to hear those stories where, where someone falls on the track and someone goes out and, and picks them up and helps them and carries them for a while. Isn't that, isn't that what we need sometimes? But Paul said it. He says, I, you know, what, else, what else really matters? Is it that I get that thing or is I, as I get that, you know, Thing that the world has to offer, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus said, and all those things will be added to you. That I might finish my course, King James Version adds, with joy. Finish my course, finish the race with joy. That that, that, that affects the decisions that you and I make today, each and every day today. The third thing now back in 2 Timothy is, is the, uh, he says, I have fought the good fight. He says, I have finished the race. And then the last thing he says there is, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Now, when you first read that, you, you think of, you think of, I've kept it, I've held on to it. And I think that's part of it. But like a keeper, this word also means to guard and watch over. You say, I need to guard and watch over my faith? Yes, you do. Why is that? Because we're in a spiritual battle and, and the enemy would like to see nothing better than your faith be destroyed. What did Jesus say to Peter? Anybody remember about his faith? This is a tough one. 
once I started, you're going to remember, though. He said, he said, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, he said. He said, but I prayed for you, what? That your faith wouldn't fail. Now, Peter, Peter he denied the Lord, but his faith never, his faith never failed. We need to guard and watch over our faith and hold on to it, yes, until we get to the promised land, till the very, very end. And, and for you and I as believers, that again, that, that, that demands us to give attention to our walk with Jesus Christ today, not wait till we get to the, the very end and then I'm going to do something. No, if, if your faith is as important as Paul is making it out to be, what are you going to do today? Are you going to spend some time with him today? Are you going to open his word today? Are you, going to, are you going to speak to him today? Are you going to guard your faith? Are you going to guard your, your devotional life, your quiet time from all those distractions, all those things that could come and say, you know what, this is way more important? You've got to guard it. You've got to guard it. There's plenty of stuff, all kinds of TV programs. It'll come. You know how many channels are on there now? Like 700? 1,000? I don't even know. There's really only one channel that's really important. It's the channel of our walk with Jesus. It's our faith. He says, I've kept the faith. And when, when it's all said and done, isn't that what's going to be important? These three things here that we... We kept fighting to the very end. We kept running to the very end. We held on. We guarded the, those things that are most important, which is our walk with Jesus. Until we get there, when our faith would become sight. Verse 8, he says, Now there is in store for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He's going to give us a crown, but it's more like this. It's a victor's wreath. It's a garland, right, that was given to the winner at the end of the race. But you know what? It's way more than that, isn't it? Just the fact that we'll be there with him forever. But it doesn't end there either, you know. Uh, he, talks, uh, he talks in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 about an inheritance. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. And you thought you weren't going to get an inheritance. And there's no inheritance tax. I saw this in the news. You know, they were all up in arms in the UK because the, in, the, inheritance, tax, in, the inheritance tax was making the government like billions of pounds. No tax on this one. This is the one that we need to worry about. This is the one that's the most important. And never perish, never spoil, never fade kept in heaven for us. The Lord's going to give us all the things that He has prepared for us on that day when we stand before Him face to face. One more passage I want to close with is in Philippians chapter 3. If you would turn back to me, uh, turn uh, back there with me. Philippians chapter 3. And verses 13 and 14. He says this, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Again, this is the same guy that's writing these words earlier, same guy that's writing the words that we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4. This was the heart. We saw in Acts, he said, nothing else matters that I finished my race, that I keep on the course. 
He says here, listen, you make mistakes, forget what's behind. We're all going to blow. We're all going to have trouble. We're all going to, you know, uh, have those times where it's just not working out. But he says, you know, forget what's behind. Let today be the day where you reach forward to what's ahead. You can say, maybe you're thinking, you know, I've kind of messed up. My life's kind of messed up. I haven't really been living for Jesus. Who, you know, what matters is what you do now, today, forward from here. Forget those things that are behind. We've we've all blown it. We've all made mistakes. He says a strain toward what's ahead and press on toward the goal to win the prize. That's the kind of heart that Paul had. That's what got him to the place of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Press on till then. Press on till then. We don't know when our day is. None of us do. We don't know when that final hour is for any of us. Most of us will not have, like Paul had, uh, knowing that it was coming up, you know. Most of us will not have that kind of warning. So we have to live today as if it might be soon. We just don't know. So, my challenge to myself and to you is today to fight the good fight of the faith. To finish the race. Keep running until the end. If you need some help, God will give you the help. And there will be people around you who will help you get back on the track. And keep your faith and hold on to it. Guard it. Don't let the world, don't let the enemy... Try to steal that which is important, the most important thing, our faith in Jesus. Maybe some of you have not even got into the race yet. I always want to give that opportunity as we pray for you to know know what's going to happen when you face this departure. Because we will all face the departure, and where will you go after that? Will it be with Jesus forever and ever, or will it be separated apart from Him forever and ever? That's the place we call hell. The other one's called heaven. The Bible talks about both. We we need to be very clear about these things. The only way we know is by trusting in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way we can know. That's the faith that we have. The faith that we put in Him to save us from sin and death. So let's pray now, and, and maybe, uh, maybe you need to make a, a decision for Jesus today. Or maybe you already have, and you need to, you need to be challenged. And, and Paul's challenge here, the way, you know, the way he's speaking here, is something that is challenging you and I to live for him, challenging us to keep going, persevere, to press on till we get there. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we, we thank you that your word is true, and it's, and it's for us. And I pray today, Lord, that, that uh, this challenge, you know, we get tired, we get weary, but you said that you would uh, strengthen the weary, you'd lift us up, you'd give us wings and strength, that we could fly again and run and not be weary and walk and not faint as we wait upon you, as we call upon you, Lord. The enemy is surely wanting to see us stumble and fall and get out of the race, but but you're there to show us that, no, not till the end. Don't quit. Don't give up. Father, we call upon you because we we are frail, we're human, we're tired, we're weak. But where we are weak, then you give us your strength. It's true. You're faithful. So we call upon you for that, Lord. I pray for each person here who's a a believer in Jesus that that they, uh, again, would uh, be committed to live and to press on to follow Jesus. Nothing else is really that important, like Paul said count my life worth nothing except that I might finish the race. I pray as well for 
for any here who have not started the race, uh, that today is a day they would, would look to you, Jesus, and, and say, I'm, I need a Savior. I want to know where I'm going to go when I die. So, Jesus, I, I call to you to be my Savior, to save me. I accept you. I receive you into my life and my heart. Father, thank you for this day that we have to be together. It's a beautiful day again. We I just uh, am struck as well, Lord, by all the urgent needs that we have in our lives. It just, uh, and I know there are probably more that, that just didn't get mentioned. Lord, help us, Lord, in this life. Again, meet every one of those needs, Lord, we pray. We look to you as the God who is able. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, shall we? Mm-hmm. <clears throat>